Good evening. Thank you very much for watching our current affairs briefing in English, where we're taking a look at the energy sector in Malta. I will be speaking with Dr. Edward de Bon. Thank you very much for joining our program, Dr. De Bonne. Before we start our analysis on the energy sector in Malta, your thoughts about the current electricity cuts? Uh, the power cuts which we are experiencing during these past two weeks um, are definitely due on account of a lack of distribution of our energy system. During these past 10 years, the Labour government has not invested um, or taken care of the increase of population from a 450,000 population. We are now reaching an 800,000 population. That is doubling our supply and our demand for energy and electricity in the various areas. So, this situation, for a lack of distribution, is bringing overloads which are tripping our electrical system. If it were not for the interconnector, which Dr. Lawrence Gonzi has had actually inaugurated prior to 2013, the system would, would have been much worse. Obviously, there's a lot of problems being created to the health of our old people. I was reading in the papers only recently that about 10 people have died on account of the excessive heat because they could not cool themselves down. A lot of people suffered burns on account of the excessive heat. And obviously, this is causing a lot of distress to businesses, households, we can't use our, our air conditioners, which today, on account of the climate change, has become a necessity because one can't live without feeling comfortable in his own home or work environment. So it's telling on the population. And according to a survey, Malta has lost in damage about 200 million euros for the cut on account of the power cuts which we are, uh, have been sustaining throughout the past two weeks. In light of this loss that you're speaking about, I'm taking into consideration what you said about the population. What are your views about our economic model? Our economic model is not um, uh, sustainable anymore. It is an economic model which is only attracting to our island people from um, Africa and Asia um, who are not giving value added to our economy but are here to work and sustain the services that we need in our economy but not giving us um, an increase in economic growth. And as a consequence of the increase in the population, obviously we are having problems in our infrastructure. We have now problems with our electricity. We shall eventually have problems, or we started to have problems with our water supply, because I heard that during these past two weeks, some areas in the island had the water supply truncated. As well, we shall, we shall soon start having problems in our drainage system because the number of people coming to the island, living here, and to those 800, one has to add also on average about um, 150 to 200,000 tourists every month because Malta receives about 2 million tourists a year. So we're talking of 
on average, a population of one, one million people at one go, this is causing big strain on the economy. According to national data, the local population has increased by 4.2 percent between 2021 and 2022. In 2022, the population continued to increase, reaching nearly 550,000. Third country nationals made up 83 percent of total migrants to Malta in 2022. Out of all the third country nationals arriving in 2022, 65.8% were male. So our economic model should not be based on cheap labour, but we should continue investing in the tertiary sector, and getting companies with value added who come and sell the services from Malta, and they make the financial base in Malta, they have an economic structure in Malta where they will help our economy grow. This is the economic model we actually need to sustain our economy and not cheap labour. What about our current economic model? Can it be reversed? I mean, you're saying we've lost about 200 million. There are these people coming here, quite a lot of them, although they're required to give a service, they're untrained. Um, some of them are not fully employed. So we're bringing poverty into our country. Absolutely. Um, uh, not only we're bringing poverty into our country, but um, if, you, if you just drive around on the island and look at um, our bus stops. These are full usually of people who work in uh, either in, in the hospitals as um, nursing aides or in the um, uh, sector, sector which gives services um, for catering and what have you, uh, and not giving any value added. The, on the buses, most people are this type of people who are not um, uh, doing anything worthwhile for the, economy, for the economy. Can the model be reversed and how quickly can it be reversed? The, the, the model will only be reversed when we will go out there and prove to our European partners, to America and Australia, where, where the investment really lies, that we are a serious jurisdiction. Unfortunately, since 2013, to date, Malta has lost its reputation. We are considered to be a country, and for, I say this with regret, where our country is considered to be a fraud-ridden country where corruption is rife, where people in government are there to see what they can get for themselves and not what they can give the country. And this is tragic. Our country is only interested in making a fast buck in construction. You see cranes everywhere, you see dust everywhere, you see building everywhere. And what happens? Standards go down, which result into the deaths of people like, unfortunately, Miriam Patch and Jean-Paul Sophia. This is a tragedy. This, what is happening, is because the authorities are not taking into consideration and seriously the rules and regulations which should monitor our construction industry. Why? Because these magnets, or some of them, are only there to bribe the powers that be to get permits as fast and as quick as possible with the least constraints. This is why we have arrived at this stage. Because instead of the people in government ensuring that our system continues producing more value added in the tertiary sector, we are interested to receive 
bribes, money laundering, corruption in the people that are there supposed to protect us, to protect our economy and our reputation. So you believe this is the general pers perception of how we are seen in spite of the fact that we're no longer grey listed? This is not a general perception, this is a reality. Don't you think that all the major deals that happened in this island during the past 10 years were rife of corruption? Electrogas, Vitals, Montenegro, Mosura, Panama Papers, all this was a scheme by Joseph Muscat's corrupt government to ensure that the people in power, like Keech Kembri, Conrad Mitzi, Joseph Muscat, and a few magnates become rich fast. And they have become rich fast. But to whose detriment? To the detriment of the Maltese people, to the detriment of our reputation, where today, the people who want to come and invest in this glorious island don't want to come over here because we've lost our reputation. This is the tragedy. And so, our economic model, from something producing a lot of value added, had to turn to cheap labor to satisfy the greed of a few contractors who are there to see they get, they get the maximum of profit with the least expense. And this is a tragedy. What is uh, your view on the style of governance today? Well, the style of governance today is still, unfortunately, Robert Abela's government does not want to take the bull by its horns and ensure that people like Joseph Muscat, Conrad Mitzi and Keech Cambry be indicted before the courts to ensure justice, not only on account of the Electrogas deal, the Vitals deal, the Montenegro deal and the Mosura deal, but also because of the political decisions and the greed that went with it, we had a political murder. Daphne Caruana Galizia was murdered on the 16th of October 2017 and to date nothing has been done where all people involved be sent to court and justice be done. And unless this situation is rectified, we will not get the value-added economy we so much need and yearn for at this particular moment in time to satisfy the burgeoning numbers which are coming, coming to our island. Can we go back to 2010 when the former Prime Minister Lawrence Gonzi updated Parliament on the status of the interconnector? One thing that struck me was the transparency in which the process went through. Uh, would you give us some background on why there was a need for an interconnector and what were the benefits of this type of contract? In my view, it seems like uh, the whole uh, um, cycle of the project was very transparent, which we don't see today. Absolutely. Um, uh, if there was something correct with Joseph Muscat said as soon as he um, uh, achieved premiership in the island, in 2013, he lauded Dr. Lawrence Gonzi for actually investing in the interconnector because this satisfied our electricity needs through, through the pipeline, through the, through the pipeline from Sicily, which was more cost effective than the LNG electrogas contract done by electrogas. In actual fact, in the National Audit Report, it was found 
on the electrogas deal that electricity produced from the interconnector is 20% cheaper than what we are paying elect for our electricity to electrogas. Mm -hmm. And you see, this falls into a pattern. Joseph Muscat, when he was in opposition, met Paul Apa Bologna, who presented this electrogas deal to him as much as he had presented this deal to Dr. Paul Borch Oliver, the General Secretary of the Nationalist Party, when the Nationalist government was in power. The Nationalist government refused this deal, but it seems that Dr. Muscat worked on what Paul Apabolonia and Jürgen Fenech wanted to do, because three days after he was elected into power, Conrad Mitzi, who was entrusted to bring to fruition this electrogas deal, together with Keach Cambry and with somebody more important than the minister and the chief of staff of the incumbent uh, prime minister, Dr. Muscad, formed three companies in uh, Panama, Hanville, Tilgate and uh, Egrant. We got to know that in two of these companies, Hanville and Tilgate, 17 Black, a company owned by Jürgen Fenech, had to invest into these companies or transfer funds into these companies of 2 million USD every year. Apart from that, we got to know subsequently that Jürgen Fenech received from Mario Portelli, the broker of this LNG tanker which we, had, which we have in Marsashlok, $300,000, which went into a company in Dubai owned by Jürgen Fenech called Wings. We know as well that Joseph Muscat, Keach Cambry and Kurt Farouja went to Azerbaijan, met Sokar to conclude this deal with Electrogas, because as you know, Sokar was a shareholder, in a, is a shareholder yes. in Electrogas, without taking with them civil servants to wrap up the deal. They went on their own without civil servants, and without um, uh, the journalists who usually attend with the Prime Minister when he's on an official visit it to any other country. It was unannounced, it? completely unannounced. It was completely unannounced. It was all hush-hush. Why? Because we got to know after that the three Maltese investors in GEM, which is the shareholder in Electrogas were Apa Bologna, Paul Apa Bologna, Mark Gazan, and uh, Thomas Group. And Jurgen Fenech had a further 10% shares in the company, and we still do not know what happened to the monies which entered into this company. What happened, however, and this is very, very strange, is that Paul Apa Bologna paid Jürgen Fenech 2.5 million dollars from Electrogas when this was in debt to thank him for wrapping up this deal and for, and these are the exact words which have been quoted, 
interfacing with government officials. So, in a, so you're talking about a brokerage deal? No, not another brokerage deal. He, they, the, the shareholders of Electrogas, that is Gazan, Apabolonia, Tumas Group, paid Jürgen Fennec 2.5 million to thank him for wrapping up this deal and interfacing with government officials. Now one just has to ask a simple question. Wasn't he doing his duty to get to fruition a contract? Why had he to be paid 2.5 million when the company Electrogas till 2021 was running in debt to the tune of 65 million. And you and I, as tax-paying citizens of this nation, were carrying the burden of a loan which these millionaires had taken of 450 million. Despite a loan of 450 million, the shareholders of Electrogas found it correct to pay Jürgen Fennec this amount of money. One would want to know, and still has to get to know, where these 2.5 million actually finished. In whose hands have they finished? Were these people Jürgen Fennec interfaced with being paid? Who are these government officials who did this interfacing with Jürgen Fennec? So you see, all this electrogas deal and all other deals have the same model of corruption headed by three government officials, Joseph Muscat, corrupt Joseph Muscat, Keach Cambry and Conrad Mitzi. The US government has come to the conclusion that two out of these three are so corrupt in the electrogas deal that they and the families can't go to the United States of America. How the US government came to this conclusion and the Malta government run by Robert Abela and the Commissioner of Police Angelo Gaffa haven't yet solved this mysterious problem that these three people are the, the pinnacle of corruption in our island is still for me something which I can't understand. These people, the Americans, the USA, found and realized that this is so, but little Malta can't find a solution to this because they are trying to continually hide and trying to maneuver themselves out of the sticky situation they are in. It's a question of time because eventually, I believe, even Joseph Muscat will be banned from going to the United States of America. And can we, can we point out that it's very unusual to be a persona non grata in the US? When uh, you realize what was happening throughout, you have to come to the conclusion that this deal was completely um, 
fraudulent. Fraudulent from the beginning. As a matter of fact, the, the owner of the LNG tanker even paid a lot of money a man by the name of Buti Armada. He owns a lot of floating barges which carry LNG, paid Mario Portelli thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions into his account, Mario Portelli, don't forget, was the broker, into a company called Orion Engineering. We still do not know what happened and where this money actually finished. So yes, as the Auditor General found in his report, and he found this very lacking, and I'm going to quote, verifications relating to fraud, bribery and corruption, internal controls, risk management considerations, ethical conduct, and other governance, governance issues did not form part of the due diligence carried out. If this is not an indictment to government, to the Labour government, that this contract was fraudulent from inception, I cannot understand how one can come to any other conclusion if not that Malta, unfortunately, has been raped by its own government. It's been raped by its own government and continues to be raped for a period of 18 years as we are bound to buy from Azerbaijan, Sokar, petroleum and gas without taking into consideration the market forces. If we don't guarantee this market, obviously, uh, we've got a contractual obligation. If we find other sources which are cheaper and the interconnector is cheaper, we can't do so. We have to continue buying these petroleum products, these gas products from um, um, Electrogas. To make Gazan up of Bologna and Tumas Group and Jürgen Fenech more, more wealthy at the expense of the poor housewife who tries to make boat ends meet from her husband's salary, for the widows who live on a pension, for the unemployed who still need the services of electricity, for all those people who live from hand to mouth. This is absolutely disgraceful and the Maltese government, the Labour government, should be held responsible for the corruption perpetrated in this deal throughout the years. Is there any possibility that this electro-gas uh, contract could be nullified in the same way that Vitals was? Obviously, this report, the National Audit Report, gives an indication that this is fraudulent and corrupt. But as you are aware, there's a, a magisterial inquiry, which after five years is still not um, uh, ready and concluded and tied up and uh, so we have to wait for this inquiry to be published but knowing what has happened in the Pilatus inquiry by done by magistrate Ian Faruja despite the fact that he indicated who are the people who should be indicted the Attorney General and the Commissioner of Police is still sitting pretty on the fence and hasn't taken 
the bull by its horns and actually acted as they ought to have acted throughout um, after, after this inquiry. So one has to see whether action will actually be taken after the magisterial report will be filed and presented to the Attorney General. This is unfortunately the grave situation this country is living where we have a democracy, of course we do, but a democracy which is lacking in, in execution of what is right and correct and getting people to justice to answer for their misdemeanors. In 2021, the opposition proposed a second interconnector. In June the same year, I believe it was about four months later, Minister of Energy Miriam Dalli uh, said that a second interconnector was going to be implemented. In your opinion, why is the government proposing a second interconnector? Because they have now realised that what Lawrence Gonzi did for this country was correct and it is only, only reasonable to have this interconnector and I presume because when the 18 years are up now already um, from 2015 eight years have passed the country will be able to continue buying gas from the, the interconnector um, connecting our country to Sicily and Italy and at a cheaper cost than what we are paying today. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, about 50 citizens have filed an action, a constitutional action, against uh, the state advocate demanding that they should not be paying extra for the electricity supply from one supplier, which is basically an electrogas and a Malta, uh, because this is only benefiting electrogas, and if government were to buy the gas directly himself, instead of creating this, I would say, I would say false, um, uh, you know, straighter, a false straighter, uh, it's an extra cost, it's an extra cost which could have been avoided and we shouldn't pay money extra when this could have been avoided not to the state coffers, not to Enemalta, but to satisfy the greed of Gazan, Tumas Group, Jürgen Fenech and Upper Bologna. This is incorrect and shouldn't happen. And there's another thing I would like to mention because uh, whilst mentioning all this system of corruption, don't forget that when Shanghai Electric came into this deal, the Chinese man who had, who had uh, brokered the deal for Shanghai Electric with, with Enamalta, buying a, a share in Enamalta, formed a company, MacBridge, where he was to receive monies into this company fraudulently from Jürgen Frenek a bella compagnia as the Italians would say. So um, when one sees the whole gamut of what has happened throughout the years one undoubtedly has to come to the conclusion that this was all based on fraud. And don't forget um, Upper Bologna from the company in the United Arab Emirates, um, uh, Wittitek, if I'm not mistaken, it's called. Jürgen Fenech formed 17 Black, and uh, Mario Portelli formed another company at the same time in the United Arab Emirates. Between May and July 2015, coincidentally, that these three brigands were capable of having the same idea in forming these companies. And the people who formed these companies for them, just one guess, Brian Tonna of Nexia BT. So this was all 
a concoction of fraud using as well, or most of them, the Maltese laundromat bank, Pilatus Bank. So this is, you realize, a system created to defraud the Maltese people, worked out, I wouldn't say diligently, but practically to perfection, but, unfor but unfortunately for them, and fortunately for us, they have been caught. And once they have been caught, they have to pay for all they have done in the rape of our country. Uh, out of all these companies you're mentioning, 17 Black, I would say, is the most notorious. Uh, what happened to 17 Black today? Well, 17 Black today is, is under investigation um, uh, by, in the magisterial inquiry and uh, we hope that there would be enough evidence for um, action to be taken against Jürgen Fenech for receiving into this company and paying out of this company bribes to government officials in order that he will become richer at the expense of the people. You've already spoken quite a lot about the Delimara power station project. And am I right in saying that Daphne Caruana Galizia was the first person to break the story? Yes. Most of these, not most, all of these deals were uncovered by Daphne Caruana Galizia. Um, most probably she was murdered, assassinated on account of this deal. Yet we haven't yet got down to brass tacks on the mechanics exactly of the involvement of all these people in her murder. But definitely, Jürgen Fenech is not the only one who should be indicted for her murder. There are other people who still are running around this island who should also be in the dock together with Jürgen Fenech. Do you think we're drawing closer to charging these people that you're speaking about? I hope so, but um, um, I will only be satisfied when the truth of the whole matter is uncovered. The key to the truth of the whole matter is Jürgen Fenech who hasn't yet said, said one word about what actually happened on that day. We know that from tapes which were uncovered by Melvin Toma that there was an involvement of Jürgen Fenech to pay for the assassination of Daphne, but we still do not know who made Jürgen Fenech pay? Who were the people, the top brass of this country, who concocted this deal in Castile? Who was more involved in her assassination? And that we'll only know when and if Jürgen Fenech will spill the beans. To date, he has decided to remain mum. He was called before the Public Accounts Committee and when they started asking him questions, his legal advisors told him that he can't do so at this juncture until all criminal proceedings against him would have ended. So it's going to be very long going. A long ongoing. protracted matter. Ongoing. Um, in 2015, it was revealed that the government of Malta guaranteed 88 million euros of a 101 million euro loan taken by Electrogas from the Bank of Electa. It seems that the loan was given to the company that failed to raise this type of money. Um, in 
your view. Is that normal that the government guarantees a privately owned company Absolutely for not. a project uh, that's state owned? Um, no, it is not. As a matter of fact, when um, government had issued the request for proposals, one of the conditions, and this was found by the Auditor General, was that the people who submitted the proposals had to satisfy the government with regards to the finance of the project. At the 11th hour, they changed the regulation because the loaning banks wanted a sovereign guarantee um, for the supply uh, protection agreement to ensure that LNG and uh, petroleum would continue coming to the island and that the loans would be paid. This obviously was a very sticky point because on account of state aid, the European Union would have clamped down on the government and refused the deal. But they changed this regulation, which wasn't, which was, which wasn't published really. And when they went to Europe to get the OK from the European Union, most of this documentation was not revealed to the European Commission. Subsequently, after this came to light, Malta got the green light that yes, they can do this deal, but it is a very unusual thing. Till 2020, there were losses of about 65 million in Electrogas, but they registered a profit in 2021 of 19.1 million. So the way forward in deals of this nature are that the private investors should actually fork out their own guarantees and their own money to finalise their deals. Can we simplify it and say that the multi-citizen is helping to guarantee a loan uh, to Electrogas and not even getting the basics of having electricity in their own homes? Not only that, and paying more for it than he would have paid if the interconnector was used to capacity as it ought to have been used. Because don't forget, we have to buy 85% of the electricity that the LNG produces. You mentioned briefly earlier the Montenegro wind farm project, the Mazura wind farm yeah. project in Montenegro. Um, how did the government of Malta get involved in that deal? Uh, bearing in mind that since then there's been a change of government in Montenegro. Yes, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, the Montenegrin government has charged the people who actually um, were going to do the deal with the Maltese government for corruption that they found in their own country on the side of these Montenegrin officials. So. One can imagine what has happened or taken place by the Maltese officials who actually um, concocted the deal with these Montenegrin officials. But um, it's still in its infancy, basically. I don't know whether um, it has been launched effectively and taken off. May I refer to the recent PAC hearings in the Parliament of Malta with uh, former Prime Minister Dr. Joseph Muscat uh, testifying. What uh, do you think about his input so far? Well, I think Joseph Muscat, one must credit him for being a strategist. If you remember correctly, Keach Kembri and Conrad Mitzi when they appeared, and Jürgen Fennec, and when they appeared before the Public Accounts Committee, all took their lawyers with them. Joseph Muscat did not, but took his PA. The reason why he did this, he thought he can beguile us even further, to try and convince us that he doesn't need a lawyer, because he didn't do anything. He didn't take a cent 
from this deal. He was given a platform for 80 minutes or to state what he, ever, what he had to state. But when he came to brass tacks, he tried to shift the blame on uh, Conrad Mitzi and Keach Cambry. He didn't want to get involved with regards to Jürgen Fenech's complicity in the whole matter. And, but he wanted as far as possible to move away from the whole deal. This was his strategy. He even had the goal to blame as um, Joe de Bonogrec for us entering into this deal with Azerbaijan, with Sokar. He stated that he was introduced to this by Joe de Bonogrec, an ex Labour MP, and I think an ambassador to Azerbaijan. He mentioned as well that prior to 2013, he wasn't involved in the electoral um, manifesto. manifesto. And the two people who were involved were Perit Carmenovella and uh, the deputy then deputy prime minister Greg. So you see Joseph Muscat here is trying to shift the blame on the deal that eventually came to fruition on other people. How can anyone believe that Greg and Carmenovella did an electoral manifesto without the input of Joseph Muscat? Who was their leader? Who was their leader? It, it's absolutely inconceivable. But this is typical Joseph Muscat. He tries to shift responsibility and blame on others. He doesn't exclude the others that they could have been involved in something heinous and not correct. But he assumes that they acted correctly as he did. Well, if the Maltese people can be beguiled with something like this, um, I think the man has lost it now. He is trying to save himself from being entangled in his own words. When actually Darren Karabot, Graham Benici, Bencini were asking questions and referring to documentation and statements that he would have said prior, years ago, he was found to be inconsistent, untrue, unreliable in what he was actually stating. Joseph Muscat is totally responsible for all the fraud, corruption, bribery that took place throughout the years. He knew that something sinister was happening in this deal. When the Panama Papers were actually uncovered, he kept on insisting in keeping Keach Kembri and Conrad Mitzi and didn't take the, the decision which he had to take and absolutely make them resign. He kept them on to conclude other heinous deals, Vitals, Mosura, Montenegro, for these other deals to come to fruition as well. Why? Because it was the same pattern throughout. The same people involved in receiving kickbacks, money, in doing deals which were not correct. So he needed them to get what he actually aimed, that is, defrauding our nation. Thank you very much for being so thorough, Dr. Dabono. The EU elections are just around the corner. What are your views as we approach the elections? And what would you say to people who would normally not vote? I think it's a mistake. If you don't vote, you are voting 
for what you do not agree with. If you don't vote, if you don't exercise your democratic right and make a choice, that means you, although do not agree with the policies undertaken and what has been happening in this island for 10 years, is giving your consent by not addressing the issue at the polls. And what about foreigners living in Malta? Foreigners, um, European foreigners living in Malta should also exercise the right to vote if this is the country they intend living in, living in. Because we all vie to have a democratic environment which is healthy, which is prosperous, where we can live in peace and harmony, where we do not need to have all this construction, where we do not need to have um, um, corruption under the cover, but where the democratic processes, as happened in England with Boris Johnson, as happened in America with Trump, take place as they ought to take place for the benefit of all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davono, for joining our program today. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching our program tonight. That was our current affairs briefing in English, where we took a look at the energy sector in Malta. I was speaking with uh, Dr. Edward De Bono. Should you wish to send any comments or queries, please do so on the number that appears on the screen. Once again, thank you. I'm Leah Hogg for NET TV, and I wish you a good evening. Mm -hmm.